Hello, everybody, and welcome to our statewide synchronous session for Introduction to Sociology for Week 3. Today we're going to be covering Chapter 4, Socialization, and Chapter 5, Groups and Organizations. We'll begin with Chapter 4. Okay? Some of the issues we're going to be looking at in this chapter, the role of socialization, the self, uh, which is the kind of individual, uh, the unique traits that make up an individual and socialization, agents of socialization, socialization throughout the life course, uh, child care around the world, looking at social policy and socialization. So some of the questions we're going to be addressing, how much of a person's personality is shaped by culture as opposed to inborn traits. This is kind of the nature versus nurture debate. Uh, in what ways does socialization continue into adulthood? And who are the most powerful agents of socialization? There are four that are kind of what we call the big four. So let's define socialization. Socialization in its core essence is just how we acquire our culture. It's a lifelong process in which people learn appropriate attitudes, values, and behaviors for the society in which they live. This is what leads to the development of personality, which is a person's kind of unique and typical patterns of attitudes, needs, characteristics, and behavior. And socialization is what leads to the development of this. An interesting paradox about developing individually, about developing your individual self, your individual personality, is that it cannot happen in a vacuum. We actually, in order to develop our individual selves, we require social interaction. So it's the interaction of heredity and environment that shape human development. Uh, in your textbook, you may have read about the cases of Isabella and Jeannie. Uh, there's another famous case of a young woman named Anna. Uh, but these kind of stress the importance of socialization experiences for children. Children need social contact in order to develop normally. Um, Isabella and Jeannie were isolated and never really developed the facility with language. They were isolated when they were young children. They did not have socialization experiences interaction with other individuals. Now, we can use case studies of people like Isabel, Jeannie, and Anna, but we cannot, as ethical social researchers, decide to isolate a newborn infant to witness what happens with development. That would not be ethical research. So, we do primate studies because primates, uh, humans are a primate. A primate um, are social creatures. And so Harlow, doing his study, showed isolation had a damaging effect on monkeys. Um, I believe he was using rhesus monkeys. They tend to be very social creatures um, and have highly developed uh, social life. And so a lot of times when we do primate studies, rhesus monkeys are good monkeys to use. Also, we can look at the influence of heredity. And this has been done through studies of twins. Um, really, the best information comes from twins who were put up for adoption and adopted separately. Because this gives us a good idea of how much... Um, is really hereditary when we look at personality and self. Um, twins scored very similarly on intelligence test scores when reared apart in roughly similar social settings. Um, however, just to show you that there is some nurture involved in this, different results when reared in different social settings. And when we talk about similar and different social settings, whether it's an educated household, the income level of the household, these will have an effect on um, the nurture portion, the, uh, the environmental portion of socialization. 
himself. This was something that George Herbert Mead, who was an early sociologist working at the University of Chicago, did a lot of work on, kind of building on ideas that Charles Horton Cooley had about the self. Um, self itself, that distinct identity, that pattern of behaviors, attitudes, values, uh, it's that distinct identity that sets us apart from others. Personality is a part of it. Uh, self is not a static phenomenon. It is constantly undergoing development, constantly changing. Um, the, it continues to develop and change across the entire life cycle. I mentioned Charles Horton Cooley. He had this idea of what he referred to as the looking glass self, which is this thing that says the self is a social construct. What Cooley it kind of like set up was this idea that we use the reactions of individuals around us and our understanding of what those reactions mean to shape our behavior. So I make an action in a social setting. I witness how people react to the action I've done. And based upon my understanding of their reactions to my previous behavior, I shape my future behaviors. So contemplation of personal qualities and impressions of how others perceive us. The self is a product of social interactions with other people. Essentially, I shape my behavior on my understanding of what your expectations of my behavior should be based upon my interpretation of your reactions to my past behaviors. So it's from Charles Horton Cooley that we get this idea of the self as a social product, as a social construct, as a result of social interactions. Mead took this idea of the self as a social construct and developed it into a process. Cooley's idea was just kind of what, how the self uses the reactions of others to shape behaviors. Mead says that the self is something that develops in a social setting through a process. We go through three stages, the preparatory stage, play stage and the game stage. In the preparatory stage, also known as the imitation stage, children imitate the people around them. When we think about using language, one of the first words that children begin to use um, with a meaning attached to it beyond the idea of mom and dad or mama and dad or however they say it is the word no. Because that's one of the first words they learn the usage of. So children will begin to start imitating parents and saying no when you ask them to do something. Because they're, they're developing the self through imitation. As they grow older, children become more adept at using symbols. This leads them to the play stage. Children develop skill in communicating through symbols and role taking. They begin to understand that people have roles in society. However, during the play stage, they understand that people have roles, but they really don't understand the idea of multiple roles or about multiple roles working together. So they can begin to take roles, process of mentally assuming perspective of another and responding from that imagined viewpoint. And you can see children in this stage, they'll play games like hide and seek or cops and robbers, or they'll play house with mom and dad in there. But these games are simplistic games because there's really not the interplay between roles. In the game of cops and robbers, you're either a cop or a robber. All the cops do the same thing. All the robbers do the same thing. But if you've ever watched a group of six-year-olds playing soccer, you understand what I'm talking about when I say that they only view one role. Each person only has one role. So when you see six-year-olds playing soccer, the coaches will take all this time setting everybody out into their individual positions, and each position has different responsibilities. As soon as the whistle blows, 
All that falls by the wayside. Every single kid charges the ball and begins frantically kicking the ball, trying to kick it into the goal, because that's what every single member of the team is supposed to do. They don't understand the different roles of forward, striker, center, halfback, fullback, goalie, or keeper, however you want to refer to it. It isn't until they get to the game stage that they can consider several tasks and relationships simultaneously and begin to understand the idea that people have multiple roles and that depending on the setting in which they find themselves, they will use the behaviors of a different role. All this leads up to the creation of what Mead called the generalized other which is sort of an internal construct of societally acceptable attitudes, viewpoints, and expectations. So what our generalized other is, is through the process of the development of the self, we develop this generalized other that allows us to interact in appropriate ways with other people in society. Now, the interesting thing about the generalized other is that the less we know about an individual, the more we rely on our generalized other to shape the nature of that interaction. When we know somebody very well, we can shape our behavior according to their specific expectations. It's when we don't know the other person very well that we have to rely on our generalized other to shape our behavior. And think about it this way. What's the first thing you do when you meet somebody? Oftentimes, you'll be introduced, you'll stick your hand out to shake hands, right? Both parties understand that this is what is done because their generalized other is telling them, when somebody sticks their hand out, you stick your hand out, we shake hands, this is a greeting um, in our culture. But we don't always do that. Okay, When I run into members of my family that I haven't seen in a number of years, our greeting may run you know, along the lines more of a giant bear hug. But that's not something we would do with people we didn't know very well. So, the self begins as a privileged central position in a person's world. Essentially, when the self is just beginning to develop, people really only have what would be called the I, what Mead referred to as the subject. The world is an extension of my needs, my desires, my wants. And the only thing that matters to me is that self. As the person matures and goes through this developmental process, the self changes and begins to reflect greater concerns about reactions of others. Usually this begins with parents. What are mom and dad going to think if I do this? I won't do this, and that way I won't have to deal with it. So when we talk about significant others, the individuals that are most important in the development of the self, and parents are usually the first significant others. But there can be other people, brothers, sisters, friends, um, even romantic relationships can become significant others uh, in the context of uh, the development of the self. And what this really means is not everybody's opinion matters to us at the same level. There are people whose opinions we value more than others. So those individuals whose opinion of us matters the most are the ones that we use to shape our behavior, and they become our significant others. Okay. Moving on now, we come to Irving Goffman, who was another kind of symbolic interaction as sociologist. I guess I should mention George Herbert Mead is a symbolic interaction sociologist and is kind of considered the founder of the symbolic interaction field. Goffman is another one who's working at that micro level of orientation, trying to look at the behaviors of individuals and understand the context of social interaction. Goffman really can be thought of, of taking the immortal bard at his word in the play As You Like It, where uh, Shakespeare has um, one of his characters 
Jacobo say all the world's a stage and all the men and women are merely players. They each have their exits and their entrances in time. And so Goffman said, when we're looking at people interacting, in a certain sense, we're looking at people acting. So he took dramaturgical analysis from the theater arts as a way of analyzing performance and applied it to interaction and said, we can look at people who are interacting as if they're putting on a performance. They are trying to do impression management. Individuals select behaviors from amongst their repertoire in order to present a favorable um, impression to create a distinctive appearance and satisfy particular audiences. Now, what this means is that depending on the setting in which we find ourselves, we will select different behaviors to satisfy those particular audiences. If you happen to be in a classroom with me, the me that you're seeing is very different than the me that shows up at a family gathering. You would not think that I was creating a very favorable impression if I used behaviors from a family gathering in the classroom. Say, wandering around in flip-flops, tattered shorts, and a t-shirt, drinking a beer, and playing basketball with family members. That's appropriate at a family gathering. That's not appropriate in the classroom. So in order to create those distinctive appearances and satisfy particular audiences, I'm selecting from the behaviors in order to manage the impression. So this is a dramaturgical analysis or dramaturgical approach. And it includes what's called face work. Um, and this face work is the work that individuals in a group do to avoid shame and embarrassment, uh, need to maintain proper image of self to continue social interaction. So you're walking down the hall and you trip. Oftentimes if we're walking down the sidewalk and we trip, whether we're walking with somebody or we're walking alone, a lot of times we'll turn around and look at the sidewalk. We're looking for that crack that tripped us up. This is face work. In the same way, if a group of students study together, say a group of six students study together, five students do excellent on a test, one student does not. Those other five students are not pointing fingers, laughing in a sing-song voice, saying, ha, ha, I did better than you did. No. They ask questions like, did you get enough sleep last night? Are you sure you read the questions carefully enough? All of this is face work done to avoid the shame and embarrassment of the one student who did not do as well. So we don't just do face work for ourselves. We do face work for other people, too. We want to avoid, we need to maintain and help others maintain that proper image of self. Um, and essentially the idea behind that is is that I want you to take at face value the things I say about myself, so I extend to you the courtesy of taking the things that you say about yourself at face value. And this helps us maintain the proper image of self as well. Freud. Now, we know that Freud did a lot of work in psychology, but Freud actually also did some work that could be considered kind of sociological. One of his famous works is a book called Civilization and Its Discontents, and that's a book examining living in a city, living in a civilization, uh, social interaction in an urban setting. But Freud also had this idea that the self is a social product. Natural impulsive instincts are in constant conflict with societal constraints. Those of you who may be familiar with Freud from psychology realize that when it came to personality, Freud said there were three distinct parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. And what Freud famously said about those was the id is the seat of base desires, the superego is the seat of altruistic impulses, the ego is where the twain wore it out and decision-making and action occurred. We can look at that idea of the superego, the altruistic, as also being societal constraints, okay? Because altruism are actions done for the benefits of other, the benefit of other people, not for the benefit of an individual. 
And so when we look at this idea of the id, our natural impulsive instincts, in constant conflict with societal constraints, which would be the superego, then the self is a social product. Personality does become influenced by others, especially one's parents, according to Freud. And the ego, uh, Freud said, the ego is the place where the superego and the id wore it out. So those components work in opposition to each other. We think, here's what I want, here's what society expects of me, somewhere in the middle is where my behavior will actually wind up. Jean Piaget was another psychologist uh, who gave us the idea of the development, of the cognitive theory of development, which is four stages in the development of cognition. This appears very similar to Mead's three stages, where we've got the preparatory stage, the play stage, and the game stage. Piaget had four theories where we went through sensory motor stage, Um, the pre-operational stage, the concrete operational stage, and the formal operational stage. And so Piaget had these ideas about how development occurred as well. There are others. Carol Gilligan was a psychologist who looked at the difference in development between males and females. Eric Erickson was a psychologist who took what Piaget had done um, as far as developmental process, Piaget and me, but Erickson extended development out past um, kind of the age of maturity, which is where Mead and Piaget both stopped. Erickson took us out past uh, middle life into end of life and said that socialization is something that goes on all the way across our life course. So, what are the ages of socialization, agents of socialization? The family is one of the big four agents of socialization. And those big four agents are the family, peer group, uh, education or school, and media or mass media. And cultural influences would come from the mass media. But the family is generally the first agent of socialization. Um, Parents are responsible for teaching children appropriate behavior prior to them showing up at kindergarten or at daycare. There are impacts of race and gender in the way that individuals are socialized. Gender role, we have expectations. This is what Carol Gilligan did a lot of her work on, was looking at how gender role affected socialization. Because we have very strong ideas about appropriate behavior attitudes and activities for males and females. Um, we have terms. Um, we do policing behavior. When we look at um, interaction between peer groups, uh, peer groups monitor to make sure that behavior is appropriate behavior with regards to gender role, with regards to lots of other things too, but especially with regards to gender role. Um, young boys in a group will monitor the behavior of all the boys in their group to make sure it all conforms to a masculine gender role. Uh, young girls will do the same thing. School is another agent of socialization, as I said. Um, school is where we learn the values, behaviors that are appropriate for our society. Schools can reinforce the divisive aspects of society as well, which is unfortunate. But peer group, um, as I said, this can be a very important agent. In fact, at a certain point in development, peer group becomes more important than just about any other agent of socialization. Um, as children grow, peer groups increasingly assume the role of significant other. Uh, from the work of Mead. Finally, mass media and technology. How much does the computer shape behavior? Um, how much does the technology of the computer shape our behavior? Uh, technology socializes families into multitasking as a social norm. Um, 
watching TV while carrying on a conversation, maybe working on the computer while watching TV and carrying on a text conversation on your cell phone at the same time. 68% um, of U.S. children have television in their bedrooms, um, and half our child population between 8 and 18 uses the Internet every day. Um, and increasingly in educational settings, this is becoming part of education, the use of the Internet. So the, the big four are family, peer group, school, and mass media. Workplace can also be an agent of socialization. And that's one of the things we all have to learn, appropriate behavior at work. Um, sometimes, though, this isn't considered one of the major agents simply because um, work comes later in a lot of individuals' lives. Um, work arrives at various times in people's lives. Some of us had paper routes um, and worked in restaurants when we were younger and worked part-time jobs. Others did not have to do that. Religion and politics both can be agents of socialization as well. Um, again, with the state, you take a civics class in high school, you take some classes teaching like uh, political science and history in college, um, but not everybody gets a, kind of exposed initially to that. Religion is a major influence in a lot of people's lives, but not everybody has a religious upbringing. But what's important about religion and state is that there are right, rites of passage that exist, getting your driver's license, voting, um, getting the driver's license that's horizontal instead of vertical, indicating that you're old enough to purchase and consume alcohol, um, baptism, communion, uh, confirmation. Some of these are religious rites of passage. Um, and rites of passage themselves are kind of signposts along the life course that indicate you have gone from one phase of your life to another. Your status has changed. It's dramatizing and validating, validating changes in a person's status. Getting a driver's license. All of a sudden, you have some, something's changed in your life. Um, and then if we think about looking at the life course, the life course approach is looking at the social factor that influenced people throughout their lives. So when, we, when they say staggered steps to independence, um, at a certain point in time in this country, you hit... 14, 15, and you were expected to begin assuming the responsibilities of an adult. There is no real clear dividing line anymore. Um, high school graduation, getting, you know, getting a driver's license, a high school graduation, getting a job, going to college, um, getting married. These things can happen in different order for different people. Um, and so there's not really that clear dividing line between adolescence and adulthood. Um, some people will be still relying on their parents, will be under their parents' health insurance, um, even if they're not living at home because they're in a residential college. Okay, anticipatory socialization, you get a new job. You and your uh, significant other are planning on getting married. And so you start rehearsing, you know, I'm going to act this way. I'm going to do these things. You know, here's what I'm going to do my first day at the new job. Here's how I'm going to talk to people. And then, you know, when we live together, here's how we're going to um, greet people when they come over and stuff like that. Maybe we'll have dinner parties and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. So it's rehearsing future occupations and social relationships in anticipation of a new social position or a new social status. Resocialization happens when um, 
you discard former behaviors and accept new ones during transition in one's life. Uh, if you join the military, if you get sent away to a boarding school, if you go to, um, if you have to go to prison, um, all of these will require resocialization. Usually, resocialization accompanies entering or exiting what we refer to as a total institutional setting. And a total institutional setting is a setting in which all aspects of a person's life are controlled. Uh, by external forces. A basic training. You don't make the decision when you eat. You don't make the decision when you wake up. You don't make the decision when you go to sleep. These decisions are all made for you. Similar in boarding school, similar in prison, um, to varying degrees. So, regulates all aspects of a person's life under a single authority. Going into a total institutional setting will require resocialization. It may be accompanied by something that's referred to as a degradation ceremony, um, which is a way of stripping away individuality and beginning the resocialization process. Um, individual becomes secondary and rather invisible in an overbearing social environment. So you join base, you join the army. Um, and you go off to basic training, and you show up there, and you've got a duffel bag full of clothes and belongings and stuff like that. First thing they do, they take that away from you, and it gets locked up until you're out of basic training. It's part of a degradation ceremony. Everybody is going to wear the same clothes, act the same way, do the same things. So when we look at socialization, Family, as I said, was one of the most important socializing agents and usually the first socializing agent. However, we think about child care, a lot of times because of dual income households, because of single parent households, 73% of employed mothers depend on others to care for their children. Um, that 27% they will work during school and stuff like that. Um, but that's not available to everybody. So 30% of mothers who aren't employed have regular care arrangements. What this means is that because few in the U.S. can afford to have a parent stay at home, sometimes that initial socialization of children is being done by people outside the family. So what we need to do is if we come at it from a symbolic interaction perspective, with that micro level of analysis, we favor studies of quality of child care outside of the home because this is what's determining how effectively children are socialized. Conflict perspective notes child care costs are burden for lower class families. Um, you know, uh, it is really, when we talk about being able to afford to have a parent stay at home, that's upper class, some middle class, but not all. Um, at least, I, I want to say between 60 and 70 percent of the families in the United States of America where you have two parents still in the family are dual income homes where both parents are working. Feminist perspective looks at the low status and wages of daycare workers because these are surrogate uh, stay-at-home parents and traditionally the stay-at-home parent in our society um, the assumption is and the stereotype is that that's going to be the female doing that. And so the feminist perspective looks at the low status and wages of daycare workers and questions how that came to be and is it because they are surrogate mothers. Okay, so policy. Policies vary throughout the world. Um, when policymakers decide child care is desirable, they determine the degree to which taxpayers subsidize it. In Europe, there is a lot more taxpayer subsidization of child care. Um, in the U.S., there is some, but not as nearly as much as there is in Europe. So this concludes our discussion of Chapter 4. Now we will move on to Chapter 5. I'm sorry I said groups. It's not groups. It's social interaction and social structure. And so we're going to be taking a look at social interaction and reality, elements of the social structure, social networks, Virtual worlds. We'll take a look at social structure in a global policy and global perspective, and look at media concentration for our social policy and organizations.
some of the things we'll be addressing in this particular chapter. What determines a person's status in society? How do our social roles affect our social interaction? What is the place of social institutions such as the family, religion, and government in our social structure? And how can we better understand and manage large organizations? So we begin with the idea of social interaction and reality. Social interaction simply is the ways in which people um, respond to someone's behavior based on meanings attached to his or her actions. There's something referred to as the social construction of reality. And the idea behind the social construction of reality is that what we accept as our social reality is collectively defined by everybody through interaction. Some groups have more ability, some groups have less ability to define the social reality. Um, so when we talk about that, the ability to define social reality reflects a group's power within society. Subordinate groups challenge traditional definitions and begin to perceive experience or experience reality in a new way. The idea of the American dream. The re there's a socially constructed reality in which anybody in this country who is willing to work hard at getting an education and then work hard at a job has upward social mobility. A lot of subordinate minority groups don't accept that socially constructed reality because it doesn't work that way for them. So they've begun to perceive and experience reality in a new way. All right. How do we look at somebody's position in society? Well, within a society, there are what are referred to as statuses. And statuses are socially defined positions within a large group or society. And people hold multiple statuses. It's collectively referred to as our status set. So we have all these socially defined positions, and they can be both ascribed and achieved. Ascribed status, one is status one is born with, such as uh, your biological sex, um, your kind of race, your ethnicity, um, your status as a child, your status as a sibling. Um, all of these. So when we say that I am a white male who's 49 years of age that has three brothers and is a child of two parents, all of those are ascribed statuses. The fact that I'm married with a wife, I'm a college professor, I'm a worker at Ivy Tech. I'm a graduate school, or I was a graduate school student. All of those are achieved statuses, statuses I work towards. So ascribed status is something you're born with. Achieved status is something you earn. And then there's a master status. It's a status that dominates other statuses and determines a person's general position in society. Oft times, master statuses or ascribed statuses. Being female becomes a master status. Uh, being African American, Asian American, um, Latino or Hispanic, Native American, these become master statuses. Um, and it's a status that dominates other statuses and becomes a part of a person's almost like self-identity. Think about what we were talking about with uh, Barack Obama. Is he when we when we were discussing him in an earlier lecture, is he simply the 44th president or is he the first black president? And you can see what we mean by this idea of master status. So the ascribed status of race and gender can function as master statuses. Statuses are position in society. Status set all the statuses a person possesses. So for me, my status set would include that of husband, that of instructor, that of brother, that of child, that of parent, that of grandparent. 
all these different things. Roles, what we refer to as social roles, are behavioral expectations for particular statuses. And so we'll all have roles, multiple roles, which are referred to as our role set. And these are all the roles that go along with all the statuses we possess. Now, sometimes we get competing demands. Sometimes it will occur from two roles. Sometimes it will occur within the same role. When incompatible expectations arise from two or more statuses, we call that role conflict. My wife was a student at Ivy Tech while I was an adjunct instructor here um, and while I was a full-time faculty member. She's always asked and always been curious about what it's like to be in my class, and I have always told her, you cannot take my class because there are incompatible expectations. My expectation as an instructor in the classroom is that I will maintain academic rigor. rigor. I will apply grading standards in the same fashion to everybody, and I will not demonstrate favoritism to any one student. However, expectations of a husband are that you will do everything you can to help your wife succeed in her goals. You'll be supportive of your wife. You favor your wife over other individuals. So this sets up a role conflict. So in a certain sense, anytime you hear conflict of interest, like in a news story, um, this judge had to recuse themselves because of a conflict of interest. What you're hearing when you hear conflict of interest is role conflict. There's also role strain when the same social position imposes conflicting demands and expectations. So we think about the role of parent. Now, one of the things is that we're supposed to keep our children happy, healthy, content. But we're also supposed to prepare our children to function in the world, to become contributing members of society. So this is going to occasionally create uh, conflicting demands and expectations because we're going to have to punish our children so they understand that actions have consequences because that's what's something they're going to need in order to be a productive member of society. But this goes against the wanting them to be happy and healthy and um, not be in pain or uncomfortable ever. There's also the process of role exit. People disengage from roles that may be central to identity to establish a new role. And there are four stages that you go through. Doubt. Search for alternatives. Actually inhabiting the new role. And then finally discarding the behaviors of the previous role. So doubt. And this happens like when a person is going from being single to being married, going from being married to being single. In a certain sense, they go through this role exit process. I'm not happy being married. I doubt this is the right person for me to be married to. So what are my alternatives? I can cheat on this person. I can divorce this person. So we search for alternatives. In the action stage, we begin laying the groundwork to go from the status of married person to single person. We may retain a lawyer. We may serve divorce papers. We may move out. And finally, we will recreate our identity as that of a single person. And so we have exited married to an inhabited single person. This comes with the creation of a new identity. If we think about it, even something like undergoing gender reassignment surgery goes through this process of role exit. So it can be something fairly minor like divorce. It can be something fairly major like undergoing surgical procedures. But they would go through the same kind of four stages there. I've never felt comfortable being a man. I've always felt like I was a woman trapped in a man's body. So what are my alternatives? Well, I can go on being uncomfortable this way. At this point in time, though, there are uh, hormone treatments and surgical alternative options for me to actually change my gender. Action stage would be <coughs> 
beginning the hormone treatments. Um, maybe undergoing surgical procedures. <clears throat> In the case of this particular role, this may require exiting other roles. You may have to find a new job. You may have to establish a new life in a new community because for something this dramatic, oftentimes there will be people who will not accept you in that new identity. So for the creation of that new identity, sometimes you may be required to um, change other statuses in your life as well. Okay. A group is two or more people. who have similar norms, values, and expectations and interact on a regular basis. Georg Zimmel was a sociologist who did a lot of work on groups, group dynamic, group interaction. Uh, he's often talked of as having kind of established what's called formal sociology, and that's not necessarily like the idea of doing sociology in white tie, you know, in uh, top hat and tails and tie and tails, that kind of thing. Um, but what, what it means is it's the form, how many people are in a group shape the nature of the interaction within the group. So the form of the group affects the behaviors and the function of the group. Groups play a vital part in society's social structure. In a certain sense, if you think about the way that you define yourself as an individual, you define yourself as an individual in context of the groups to which you belong. So when we think about the idea of group interaction, there are all kinds of things that we can kind of look at. Um, the way that the size of the group shapes the nature of the group. Um, going from a dyad, which is a group of two, to a triad, which is a group of three, involves a shift in a number of dynamics. Um, one being... Um, in a group of two, you either have consensus or disagreement. In a group of three, you now have majority rules. You also have the possibility of neutral mediation. Two people in a group get into a dispute. The third group can act as a neutral party and mediate the dispute between them. In a group of two, that can't happen. A group of three can have um, what's referred to as tertius gaudens, the third who profits. There's a disagreement going on between two people. And if we think about, like, a, an extreme example of that would be the case of divorce, where both parents want to spend money and time with the child, so the child is benefiting from the conflict between the two parents. The child did not s set out to split the parents up to uh, get that benefit, and that's why it's referred to as the third who, pro who profits. There's also divide ed impera, divide and conquer. And this is the individual who purposely creates conflict between the other two group members in order to profit from that. So, got the, the idea of groups here. Social institution. Um, don't think of a physical location when I say social institution. What I'm talking about are patterns of behavior organized around basic human needs. So, social institution include things like family, economy, politics, education, religion, health, technology or science and technology. These are kind of social institutions. Uh, groups play a vital part in society's social structure. I think we just saw that in the, yeah, I'm not quite sure why they're putting it there. Um, but each social institution needs to think about um, these three points right here. Each social institution has to replace personnel, teach new recruits, um, and produce and distribute goods and services in order for the social institution to continue in a stable uh, environment. So family has to replace personnel. Family has to teach new recruits. Family has goods and services that get produced and distributed. Education, economy, religion, all of these things kind of have this. And so each of these organizations has to think about also preserving order and providing and maintaining a sense of purpose. Now, there are social institutions that do this for all of society, too. If we talk about replacing personnel, the social institution that does that for society is the family. If we talk about teaching new recruits, the social institution that does that for society is education. 
Producing and distributing goods and services is the economy. Preserving order is politics. Providing and maintaining a sense of purpose, politics, and religion. So if we look at the conflict view of social institutions, um, according to Marx, all institutions are shaped by the nature of the economy, and all institutions um, maintain the privilege of the elites within a society. So politics, economy, education, family, religion, according to the conflict view, all help maintain privilege of the elites in society. So how does family do that? Well, let me answer that question with a question. What did Paris Hilton do to deserve a billion-dollar fortune? Being born into the right family. So the answer to that question is families maintain social inequality through the practice of inheritance. Religion maintains social inequality, according to Marx and conflict theorists, by keeping people focused on getting into heaven. And that makes them ignore the inequality that exists right in front of their faces. If we think about Christianity, you cannot serve God and mammon both. The meek shall inherit the earth. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven. So we've got people, the, the rich are being protected by the tenants in there, expressed in there. If you want to get into heaven and you can't focus on wealth here and now, well, that protects the wealth that I have from other people. Education does this as well uh, through what's called the hidden curriculum and tracking. And we'll look more at that when we get to the chapter on um, education. Politics, of course, and the economy, we've got chapters on those too, and we'll look more deeply into those as well. Social institutions uh, are inherently conservative in nature. Uh, they operate in gendered and racist environments. Social institutions tend to want to resist change. It's what's referred to um, as kind of uh, the iron law um, of the bureaucratic structure. And we'll look more at that when we talk about Max Weber and his ideas on bureaucracy. Um, all bureaucratic structures inherently come to view the, uh, themselves as necessary and to just kind of promote their own existence. Social institutions affect everyday behavior. Well, how does that happen? Well, let's think about it for a second. From the interactionist perspective, which is all about everyday behaviors, if I were to meet you in a different institution, like say we met... Uh, at a grocery store where both of us are customers, our roles are different. So our interaction is going to be different. In the educational setting where I am the instructor and, and you are the students, that shapes the nature of our interaction because the instructor has some social power in that relationship. So social behavior is conditioned by roles and statuses we accept, groups to which we belong, and institutions within which we function. Okay. So moving on from institutions to networks, social networks are essentially all the people you know. It's a series of social relationships that link a person directly to others and then indirectly to other people. And so, you know how it says, you've heard the saying, it's not so much what you know as it is who you know? Social networks are who you know, okay? Um, networking is involvement in social network. Uh, it becomes valuable when job hunting. 60% of the jobs that people get in our society, they acquire through social networks. You can look at the one ads. You can go to headhunters. You can use Monster.com. The fastest way to find another job is to reach out to people in your social network. Now, networking can center on any activity. I mean, if you think about it, how many different groups do you belong to? Do you belong to um, 
a group of people that play games? Do you belong to a league for bowling or something like that? Uh, you're in this class, and so the students in this class are um, education. It's a network. All these different networks. And how many of us have social networks, virtual uh, social networks? Um, Facebook page, LinkedIn page. Um, advances in technology make it possible for people to maintain social networks electronically. Geographic proximity is no longer requisite for friendship. Um, in fact, how many people have friends on Facebook they've never actually met face to face? Or how many people play what are referred to as um, kind of the online gaming communities? Oh, I forget what they're in the MMORPG, ma multi, uh, massively multiplayer online um, role playing games. And I know that's. Not everybody plays those, but if you think about it, playing World of Warcraft, playing Halo, um, playing these kind of uh, online games through Xbox and through PlayStation, um, you can have gaming friends in other countries that you've never met face to face. Virtual networks can also help preserve real world networks interrupted by war or dislocation. Say you move. Facebook makes it easy to keep in touch with people that are in the original location from which you moved. All right. The complexity of modern society. Durkheim had these ideas about mechanical and organic solidarity. Solidarity for Durkheim was a form of social, it's, it's what he termed social cohesion. So when he's talking about solidarity, what he's talking about is the way that we're connected in society. And mechanical and organic solidarity are two different ways of being connected to a society. One of them you find in an agrarian, pre-industrial society. The other you find in um, an industrial society. And the interesting thing is, is that mechanical solidarity is what you find in an agrarian pre-industrial society, and organic solidarity is what you find in an industrialized society. And I know that sounds weird, but in, a, in an agricultural society, an agrarian society, if you live in a farming community, chances are that you do the same job as a lot of your neighbors, which is farming. And so you're very similar to your neighbors in the work that you do. This will lead to similarity as far as behaviors, values, and attitudes. So in an agrarian society, social cohesion or solidarity is based on the mechanics of similarity. In an industrial society, chances are not that you're going to be doing the same job as everybody else. Think about how many different jobs there are um, in our society. And in order for us to provide for our needs, all these different people have to do all these different jobs. Um, I cannot build a car. I cannot refine steel. I cannot refine rubber. I cannot refine petroleum. Um, I go to the grocery store or I go to a restaurant. Um, I do not make my own clothes. I go to a, a clothing store to buy those. And so it's not so much that I'm similar to all my neighbors. It's that I need all my neighbors because all I do is teach, and then I use money to provide for all my other needs in society. This is very similar to Ferdinand Tony's ideas of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Gemeinschaft is the type of rural connectivity you find in small farming communities. And Gesellschaft is the type of lifestyle you find in large urban centers. And Gemeinschaft tends to be um, a more kind of uh, connected, again, based upon tradition. Uh, you are connected to all your neighbors because you know all your neighbors. This is different from what you find in a large urban center where it's more anonymous. Um, and so Gesellschaft is the type of uh, lifestyle you find in a large urban center. It tends to be more anonymous um, and less uh, about 
tradition and knowing all your neighbors. And finally, we have Gerhard Lenski's sociocultural evolution approach, which looks at the level of technology in a society um, and looks at the complexity in a society based upon the level of technology they have. Um, and there will be pre-industrial, early industrial, late industrial, and post-industrial societies in kind of that sociocultural. And when we look at pre-industrial, we have hunter-gatherer, and then we have horticultural and pastoral, and then we have agricultural. And then we have early industrial, late industrial, and post-industrial. Um, and so what Lenski was looking at there was this idea of the level of technology and how complex that makes society. So the division of labor. This is where Durkheim outlined his ideas on mechanical and organic solidarity. Mechanical solidarity is a collective consciousness or a social cohesion that emphasizes group solidarity, um, that emphasizes similarity, the mechanics of similarity. All individuals perform similar tasks, and so they have similar values, beliefs, and behaviors. Organic solidarity is more about the collective consciousness or social cohesion that hinges on the mutual, inter mutual interdependence and complementary differences in society's members. Everybody is connected because everybody needs everybody else doing their jobs. Gemeinschaft. As I talked about with Tani's small community in which people have similar backgrounds and life experiences, and then Gesellschaft, large community in which people are strangers and feel limited in co little in common with other community residents. Society's level of technology is critical to the way that it is organized, according to Gerhard Lenski's sociocultural evolution approach. Human societies undergo a process of change characterized by a dominant pattern known as sociocultural evolution. Technology, according to Nolan and Lenski, is cultural information about the ways in which the material resources of the environment may be used to satisfy human needs and desires. So we're doing this over the computer. The computer itself as an object is not the technology. The technology is the knowledge of how to take plastics and metals and silicone and carbon and create a computer out of all those different things. So, detailing Lenski's sociocultural evolutionary approach, uh, hunter and gatherer societies, there is no uh, productive surplus. In hunting and gathering societies, people rely on whatever foods and fibers are readily available. Horticultural societies, um, well, technically, horticultural societies don't plant seeds. They tend them. They find naturally growing seeds and tend them. Pastoral societies are societies in which uh, it's a nomadic lifestyle using uh, herding, herding of goats, herding of sheep, things like that. In agrarian societies, people primarily engage in the production of food, and agriculture is where people clear land and plant specific seeds and crops. And then industrial societies, the big shift there is people are getting away from reliance on animal power and are beginning to rely on other types of power that lead towards mechanization to produce goods and services. They rely on inventions and energy sources. Change the function of a family as a self-sufficient unit. Families are still helping each other out in the communities prior to this. Uh, this is where we begin to see um, the nuclear family as a self-sufficient economic unit. And then post-industrial and post-modern societies are characterized by deindustrialization, which is the manufacturing jobs leave a particular society, and economic system engaged primarily in processing and control of information and providing services. Technologically sophisticated society preoccupied with consumer goods and media images. So processing information, processing and controlling information, 
um, and also working within the service sector uh, where the consumer goods, retail, restaurant, hospitality. Um, and those are characteristics of post-industrial and post-modern societies. So, focus on media, media concentration. Uh, technological innovations change the way we shop and share information. You can live your life without ever leaving your house now. You can find a job where you don't have to leave the house. You can shop online. You can communicate with other people online. You don't ever actually have to leave the house for anything. The problem, of course, is that people who use these complex communication systems without understanding the un underlying technology creates the potential for misuse. How many of us actually understand um, DSL or Wi-Fi? When we think about what's produced in the media, there are only six companies that control the majority of media in the United States of America. Um, so, a few large corporations own most of the media production and distribution process. They're the ones that get to decide what gets released. Um, the Internet is actually reducing that somewhat by allowing people to produce their own uh, media. We can produce videos and upload them on YouTube. Um, there's all kinds of things that, you know, we can produce. We can have our own web page. So media deserves special attention because it filters our view of reality. The concentration in few large corporations from the functionalist perspective uh, is a step towards greater economic efficiency. Um, but the concentration according to conflict perspective of media stifles the chances for minority ownership um, and also leads to what's referred to as gatekeeping, um, in which the elites are getting to decide what the rest of us have to consume. Um, an interactionist focuses on the changes in how people get their news. How many of us actually just sit down to watch TV to get news anymore? And how many of us are going to online sites or we may be viewing news through YouTube instead of viewing news when it's actually on? Um, so the Telecommunications Act of 1996 eliminated most restrictions on media ownership and it was following 1996 that you began to see uh, the concentration of media basically claiming that it would be better uh, so the lack of government restraint of media concentration ascribed to unique relationships politicians have with the media industry people in the media donate or companies like media corporations donate large sums of money um, to political campaigns and so the fact that there's not a lot of government restraint um, can be ascribed through social research to the relationship politicians have with media industry okay <coughs> this concludes our lecture for today Pardon me. My name is Matthew Howell. I'm located at the Valparaiso campus of Ivy Tech. M Howell one at IvyTech.edu. That's M H O W E L L one at IvyTech.edu. Should you want to contact me with any questions or anything?